Good morning. Thank you for being here. My name is Dean Garfield. I'm the President and CEO of the Information Technology Industry Council, a collection of the global leaders in information and communication technology. Uh, we, along with ITIF, the Innovation Foundation, are co sponsors of this morning's event. Uh, we really appreciate you being here this morning. Uh, I'm really excited about this morning's panel. I have no doubt that this panel is about to change the course of history. <laughs> I've heard what you say. How do I know you ask? Well, I happen to have the privilege of attending the first in the series of these panels last year, where we talked about the role that innovation can play in improving our energy and national security. Less than a year later, the, from that discussion grew an appropriation of $30 million to advance the role that innovation can play in improving our energy security. And already, again, less than a year later, uh, there are at least 27 projects that are moving forward. I know there's a lot of work that went into that eventuality, but my view is the panel a year ago was the linchpin for that occurring. That's my story and I'm sticking with it. So today we have bits and bricks, the role again that IT and innovation can play in improving the construction industry and construction sector. My expectation a year from now is that GSA will achieve great efficiencies in its buildings and projects, saving taxpayers billions of dollars, uh, building, improving its buildings, uh, and otherwise avoiding waste and getting things done much faster and more efficiently. Uh, I hope I set the bar appropriately low uh, for this morning's panel. Uh, speaking of setting the bar, uh, I would like to turn things over to our moderator, uh, someone who is well respected and no matter what I require set, uh, is always able to get a, a founder uh, and president of ITA Innovation, uh, Innovation Foundation, Dr. Rob Anderson. Uh, the FCC 
and the uh, Senate Committee on uh, Public Works and Environment. Uh, he has a, a Juris Doctor from uh, Yale Law School. Uh, next is uh, Phil Bernstein. Phil is the president, vice president of Autodesk, which is a leading provider of software for architecture and engineering. Uh, Phil has been a practicing architect for 25 years, and he leads the industry strategy and relations for the AEC division at Autodesk, uh, where he's responsible for setting the company's future vision and strategy around technology serving the building industry. Prior to joining Autodesk, uh, Phil was associate principal at Pelly Clark Pelly, which was a, an architect, uh, and he also was taught at the Yale uh, School of Architecture and has a long uh, publishing background, uh, distinguished uh, many, many articles. He's also co-editor of Building in the Future, Recasting Labor and Architecture, uh, published in 2010 by Princeton. Uh, and next is uh, uh, Shan Sundar, who is the director of the Engineering Laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, Shan is chief, has been, uh, had a long career at NIST, uh, was chief of the Structure Division and then the Materials and Construction Research Division. Uh, he was acting deputy director of the Building and Fire Research Laboratory uh, and uh, a number of other posts at NIST in this similar area. Prior to that, he was a faculty member at MIT and holds a PhD uh, in, uh, from MIT as well. Uh, and last uh, is Robert uh, Weeble. Uh, Bob is the senior project manager at FIATEC. Uh, FIATEC is a sort of, a, if you will, a semitech for the construction industry. Uh, it's a consortium nonprofit group that's focusing on bringing the industry and government and other players together around technology innovation. Uh, in that role, he is charged with coordinating private sector support for government use of IT uh, in building regulatory and land use programs including the use of electronic plan review technology. Uh, again, Bob has a long, long background. Uh, most recently wrote a book called Architectural Security Codes and Guidelines, Best Practices for Today's Construction Challenges. Uh, he was also the executive director of the National Conference on States, uh, National Conference of States on Building Codes and Standards. So this is, as you can tell, a really, really great panel. Uh, so I don't want to talk too long, but I do want to just quickly set the stage. Uh, and so why we're doing this, well, why is it important for Washington to pay attention? Uh, for one reason, construction is a, is a fairly large industry in the U.S. It accounts for 4.5% of GDP. Uh, and if we had greater productivity in the construction industry, all our standards of living would go up. Uh, we would have cheaper buildings, and that would translate into higher incomes. Unfortunately, uh, when you look at the performance of the U.S. construction industry, uh, it's either uh, mediocre or abysmal, uh, depending upon which statistics you look at. Uh, the mediocre, the abysmal uh, statistics suggest that it's actually one of the only industries in America that has had declining productivity over the last 40 years, which is very hard to do uh, as an industry. You have to really work hard at that. I, I think those numbers are actually probably wrong. Um, for a number of different measurement problems. But other studies that I think maybe are a little more accurate find that the industry has had a productivity growth rate of one quarter of the rate of overall U.S. productivity. So really, I think the evidence is very clear. This is an industry that simply has not had the productivity growth that other sectors have had, uh, certainly not sectors like IT, which has had very, very high productivity growth. So there's some real potential opportunities there. And uh, it, it may seem strange to talk about innovation in IT when we're talking about construction because isn't IT about moving information and bits and all of it? In fact, much of construction is actually about information. Uh, it's about managing and communicating uh, between designers, contractors, suppliers, construction workers. Uh, it's not as if all of a sudden magically a bunch of bricks and steel show up at a site and magically they get put up. That is a coordination problem that has to get solved. It's about virtual design models. It's about construction and scheduling models. It's about supply chain management. It's even about technologies like laser scanning. Uh, I saw a demonstration of that in Detroit a few years ago by General Motors. And there's this, which Phil and others know about better than I do, but there's this technology called laser scanning where they can put a laser in a, in a big factory, turn it on, and within just really a few minutes, the laser will have made it a totally accurate, down to the millimeter level, 3D rendering of the, of the inside of the building, uh, which then they can then put into a computer program.
program and start moving things around and putting them in there. It's an amazing technology that could potentially, uh, is potentially improving technology, that uh, productivity. But I think one of the reasons why we're here today really is 10 years ago, a lot of these technology opportunities simply didn't exist. Uh, we could talk about productivity all we wanted to, but we didn't have the technology suite available. Today we have widespread use of IT. We have what's called building information modeling or BIM. Uh, we have wireless devices that uh, it's hard to run a broadband wire to a construction site and plug in your computer. Now we have 4G wireless that, that can you, you know, so when you're out and about in a mobile environment like that, you have connectivity. Uh, we even have things like iPads where construction managers and others have a portable device that's very powerful. We have things like RFID. So we have a whole suite of technologies now that can be applied to the construction industry. The real question then is why doesn't this happen? Why doesn't the industry just look at these technologies and say, these are great technologies, let's adopt them? Well, I think one of the main reasons is industry fragmentation. This is a really, in some ways, not unique industry, but different industry than, say, the retail industry, where you have big players who can have the sophistication to adopt technologies. According to a recent National Academy of Sciences study last year, 2009, 98% of construction firms in America have fewer than 100 workers. And they employ about 80% of all construction workers in America. So this is a very fragmented, small-scale industry. Uh, not only that, but you have small firms that deal with different aspects. So it's not an integrated industry. You have design firms, planning firms, engineering firms, construction. And even in construction, you have subspecialization. So it's not like there's one big firm that's out there or multiple big firms that have sophistication and capabilities to do this. There's also really almost no R&D. Uh, this is an industry that invests uh, R in R&D at, at one-tenth the rate of U.S. manufacturing. And lastly, there's really no ability or very little ability to, court, to deal with what you could call chicken or egg problems. So if you think about how you really integrate and solve a lot of these problems, everybody in the system has to do this, has to act at the same time. It's a little bit like healthcare where doctors and hospitals and clinics and testing facilities all have to adopt IT. This is quite similar. You have to have material suppliers, for example, adopt uh, automated and IT-based material systems. But the construction users, the construction contractors have to adopt that as well. And so there's a real coordination. So what should we do, and we'll get into that in detail, but I think it's important to note this is not a new problem. We've been talking about this problem in America for over 50 years. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the uh, Lyndon Johnson effort uh, in the Johnson administration in 1965 called the Civilian Technology Opportunities Program. If you're not familiar with that program, this was a program that was, put in, or was designed to put in place to help a number of industries that had lagging productivity, one of them being construction. But what happened to that program, Congress decided they didn't want to fund it because they were afraid it was inappropriate industrial policy, sort of violating the spirit of the free market. And so that program, that R&D program, never got funded. In 1986, the National Research Council did a project on construction, and they proposed uh, actions by the federal government to increase efficiency. Nothing happened with that either. In 1995, uh, the National Science and Technology Council did a study on construction and building, and they advocated for increased federal research for U.S. construction. Again, nothing happened after that. And most recently, 2009, the National Academies did a study proposed, again, similar types of efforts. Again, nothing happened. Uh, so what can we do? I think we can do two big things, and that's part of the structure of this panel. One is on the demand side. We have the two largest buyers of construction services in the world on this panel this morning. And as buyers, they can play an important role in encouraging that the people they buy from adopt best practice technology. And that's already been happening with uh, building information modeling, but there's possibly other areas we could do that. Uh, there's also the supply side. In other words, we can take steps to help the supply side of the industry become more innovative. And if you look at what other countries are doing, it's really remarkable uh, what other countries Korea, for example, has an institute of construction technology where they have 600 people working in this government-funded and corporate-funded institute. Uh, and not surprisingly, the Korean productivity growth rate in construction is 10 times higher than American productivity. Uh, I don't think those two things are unrelated. I think it's the fact that the Koreans have said this is an important industry, it's an industry that's going to be dependent upon innovation, 
and they're going to help in a cooperative public-private effort. The Europeans do the same thing. They have a new program called the European Construction Technology Platform, which is funded by the European Commission and industry. They have over 600 partners from industry and government. The U.S. really doesn't do that. The, the most uh, uh, the strongest effort we have is represented on the panel here with FIATEC. And FIATEC is a great, great effort, but I would argue is, is significantly underfunded. Uh, really needs significantly more resources. And we also have a great effort uh, at NIST. Uh, NIST is, is really, I, I think, the, the, the hub in the federal government of research in this area. But again, significantly underfunded. So the real question, I think, then, is why don't we act? Why haven't we done more? And, and I think it's really two things. One is, this is not, uh, this is a, this is a non-trade sector, so it's not really in competition with foreign countries. There's certainly some foreign construction companies that come to the U.S. and, and to take market share, but they're generally employing U.S. workers. Uh, so there's this feeling that it's not as urgent to say what's going on in the semiconductor industry or the car industry. We're not going to lose it. But uh, the other part of it is I think that there is this real uh, sort of view that the way we're going to grow our economy is with macro policy. We just get interest rates right. Uh, if we just make sure that bank lending goes on, if we just have an educated workforce, these things magically take care of themselves. And I think what we've seen over 40 years is these things magically don't take care of themselves. That this is an industry that has just structural problems in terms of becoming a more high productive, high innovation based industry. And that a public private effort uh, that we have little steps here, both through NIST and through FIATEC, can play an important role. So with that, uh, I'm hopeful that we can begin to make real progress in this area. I want to turn it over here now to Phil, and uh, we'll take it away. Okay, thanks, Rob. Let me um, first start by sort of completing uh, our, our, our main bridging argument from some of Rob's original remarks. Our business is about providing information technology to the construction industry. But I want to suggest to you that this whole discussion needs to be focused not so much on uh, tools or the selection of software or even hardware. It's a process problem, it's not a tool problem. It's about the sort of structural business issues that are uh, deeply characteristic of the building industry. And one of the things that we talk about a lot in our shop is how uh, technology as an artifact, pieces of technology as artifacts represent business processes and the relationships between the players in the overall construction process. And we can write cool software until the cows come home, but if there are not some discussions about the related structural process issues, there are not going to be the kinds of changes that we are talking about here. I mean, uh, as an architect and someone who's uh, built buildings for most of my career, I can speak to a lot of these kinds of questions about fragmentation and the different players who are necessary to process and the lack of industry standards, the lack of the industry as a whole lacks mechanisms to organize itself and sort of figure out what it needs to do and where it needs to go. Um, I actually disagree a little bit with Rob's contention that the, our industry is not uh, seeing some pressure from globalized competition. Some of my biggest customers right now are companies like Balfour Beatty, a British contractor that just bought Par Parsons Brinkerhoff, Scansta, which is based in Sweden, but is one of the largest construction companies in the United States, and even Hawk Teeth, who is a European consortium that owns Turner Construction, which is the largest construction company in the United States. So we're going to start seeing global pressure you know, in, a, in a different kind of way. The, the industry itself, however, has been characterized by low IT adoption because there's been virtually no mechanism for building consensus around structural process change. If you look at the um, acceleration of U.S. productivity in the study that Rob cited, a lot of that productivity acceleration was because of the ability of other industries, agriculture, phar pharmaceuticals, uh, manufacturing, to correlate their business processes with underlying IT acceleration. And we have been unable in the building industry to do that. And there are, uh, there are structural reasons for that that go beyond, you know, the disinterest that we have on building sites and technologies that are more advanced than things like microwave ovens to heat up the burritos during the lunch break. You know, it's, um, the building industry itself, because of these structural business problems, is characterized by very low margins. The profitability of the U.S. design and construction industry is very low. And low profitability 
correlates directly to low levels of innovation because no one is willing to actually take a risk on anything that's interesting, including a major transition in the business process change that could be catalyzed by technology. And so again, this kind of reinforces what I believe we've been in argument here, which is the issue here is about changing the focus of the building industry and its use of information technology from the making of artifacts. In other words, I design a building and I hire a contractor and I deliver that artifact to Bob or to Dorothy to a, a, an idea about operations. How does that thing actually work? What is its performance? What is my responsibility as an architect or a contractor for that building's performance? And those kinds of ideas will, uh, will change the nature of the process and therefore change the nature of the underlying need for technology. And there are very few large-scale organizing forces in the worldwide building industry. There is, for example, no single mechanism in the United States for architects, engineers, and contractors to sit down and talk about these problems. All we have are large-scale owners like these folks sitting to my right. Every time they make a move, the industry automatically snaps its attention to them because of the scale and ripple effect of the kinds of decisions that they make. And so we have, if we're going to get to this problem of how we, get, we correlate process improvement with information technology, we're going to have to think about making some underlying process changes that are catalyzed by the kinds of technologies that are out there. And the, and the technologies that are out there, I mean, I, I like to talk about toys as much as anybody else. Right? I, I love all these, all these fun toys that we make. But I don't, I don't really think that's the purpose of this discussion. You know, companies like ours make fairly radical underlying technologies that are attacking some of the basic processes that are used in the building industry. You know, my skills as an architect are mostly obsolete. I train as a drafts, draftsman. I know how to use tools like pencils and triangles and scales, which none of my students use anymore. All the entire industry is transitioning from physical artifacts to digital artifacts. But that changes more than just using electronic devices to make drawings. We're actually looking at a fundamental change in the means of representation. We're looking at going from delivering a project to Bob and Dorothy in the form of drawings to the form of high resolution digital models. And that, you know, they're cool, they look great, they're in 3D, you can, you can spin around in space and see what they look like. But what those things actually are are digital simulations of the artifacts that are being built, which allows you to talk about how the artifact is going to behave in its future life, rather than just this kind of abstract set of diagrams that I would provide to these folks and say, I assert to you that this building is going to operate a certain way, and I wish you and your staff would have to interpret these ideas from this set of drawings that I'm about to give you. The digital model is a, is a platform by which one can test these kinds of ideas, but it's not a software upgrade problem. Going to that kind of a paradigm suggests that the, the means of representation changes the responsibility of the players. The, the idea that a design team provides a digital model suggests that they're taking responsibility for how that artifact actually operates. And none of the other processes that large-scale institutional owners, including the federal government, use to manifest that kind of representation reflect that kind of revolutionary change. My obligations, for example, as an architect providing a digital model to a client are radically different than they would be if I were providing drawings. That means that the, the discussion about the roles and responsibilities, the obligations, the business models, the risk management ideas, the way people are compensated, the artifacts of the contracts and, and structures themselves have to be re-examined. And that's, those kinds of organic innovations are only happening in the margins of the industry because there aren't big enough players except for the government to actually explore them. So there are technologies that are extremely provocative out there. There are model-based ideas. This laser scan has come a long way since your factory visit. I can have this building laser scan and have a high-resolution 3D model of it in about two days, which we could then use to explore its energy performance, its uh, renova renovation strategy, you can use it for facilities management infrastructure. But there's no actual business model under which I could provide those services to government right now because all of our procurement strategies, and in fact, the entire building industry is predicated on a sensibility that has a different structure. It's about lowest first cost. My job as the designer is to make sure I hit the budget. My job as the contractor is to make sure I hit the budget. I don't really care how the building operates. That's not part of my responsibility. Because that's how the business structures 
our lives. Uh, what I'm trying to suggest here is we can do all the building information modeling, laser scanning, cloud computing, large scale data management stuff that we can possibly think of, but unless we're willing to look at innovations in the way teams are structured, how their responsibilities are aligned, and how the technology can attack the underlying process problems, we're actually not going to make any progress at all. Now, there's been a lot of great work that's happened here. In fact, I would argue uh, that the building information modeling uh, juggernaut that has happened here in the US, where the adoption of that technology is greater than it is anywhere else in the world, uh, the GSA is largely responsible for that. They, they, we conceptualized the idea, but it really wasn't until the GSA decided that they were going to uh, institutionalize it as a standard that the industry actually began turning in that direction. And a lot of the work, Dorothy, that your team has done um, uh, in research initiatives and some of the work around energy upgrades definitely has the industry's attention. But until we are willing to use that uh, large institutional presence of the federal government to innovate both business process and correlate that business process and technology, I, I continue to think that we're still uh, in the end sort of working in the margins. And so in my view, there are these big chunks of technology, means of representation, laser scanning, uh, data collection, cloud computing, but if we don't look at the problem from the perspective of uh, driving some research, it's really unbelievable how many research is in the building industry. But by my calculations, it's less than $500 million a year in an industry that represents almost 5% of GDP. My company, spends more in a year on R&D than the federal government does in the industry, which is silly or tiny. There are standards around contracts and business models and risk and compensation strategies and project delivery approaches. And then there are the possibility of doing example projects. You guys represent the, uh, the platform by which the largest number of square feet and projects can happen. And I think that's a, and I think it's an enormous, uh, I think it's an enormous opportunity, but I, I guess what I'm here to suggest, based on my work, is we can make as much cool technology as you can think of when we can talk about toys all day long. But if we don't get good correlation between structural business innovation, we won't get IT innovation. Okay, thank you, Paul. That's great. Uh, is there some seats up here, by the way? Folks want to hear a couple here or there, so feel free to just come on up. Uh, we'll turn it over next to uh, Shannon. I think uh, Rob kind of stole some of my thunder, but, but it's, it works with you. Um, the construction industry in 2010 accounted for $500 billion uh, of U.S. GDP. Uh, it's somewhat smaller compared to what it was in 2007 or 8. The value of construction put in place as opposed to the value that the contributors to GDP was actually $804 million in 2010 of which new construction was roughly $547 billion and renovation was $257 billion. So it is, in fact, a very large industry. And that's not even counting the amount of uh, investment the U.S. makes in energy, water, and services that are provided to those buildings, which in 2010 was about uh, $552 billion, energy being $430 billion. So, if you add the energy component and, and the operation component to it, you're up to $1.3 trillion that is spent somehow related to things that are built and used. So it plays, uh, this industry played a very significant role in the U.S. economy. Now what are the drivers for change uh, in that industry? There's clearly global competition, and I think uh, my colleague from Autodesk has identified there is, in fact, global competition. Uh, technology is changing, uh, and there's tremendous demand for energy efficient and sustainable construction. Uh, there is a business imperative for sustainability in construction. There's demand for better quality, uh, higher performing and innovative products and, and facilities. And most importantly, there is a demand for higher productivity and lower construction costs. <coughs> There are some studies which suggest that 25 to 30 percent waste and inefficiencies exist in materials and labor cost of construction. 
Uh, now that's not even including the roughly 2.2 trillion that's an estimated to investment to renew our nation's infrastructure. <coughs> and many different groups have, have talked about this. Uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers has talked about it. Now, I think the former Comptroller General of, of the United States uh, has an organization that focuses on how we uh, uh, renew our nation's infrastructure. And then that is not even counting the fact that we have new demands for national security and disaster resilience that our nation faces. <coughs> and of course, the challenges facing this industry are also equally big. Uh, enhancing productivity at all levels, uh, reducing waste and inefficiencies, as I mentioned before. And as Rob mentioned, the industry is fragmented. The supply networks are distributed. And there's inadequate in a, in the innovation ecosystem, which means really what you need to stimulate uh, change. <laughs> and enabling that innovation and competitiveness you know, requires better metrics, better life cycle performance-based decisions, uh, and, and of course, emerging uh, the tools and standards that you need to adopt in an industry that generally is risk-averse in so far as technology adoption is concerned. There's a tremendous amount of risk in the industry in doing the projects that are done in that industry. <coughs> And of course, as many people have pointed out, R&D is, is a huge uh, gap. What makes this complicated is that the diverse set of stakeholders in the industry have very different interests. The manufacturers of materials and products clearly are motivated to innovate and also to enhance productivity. The IT and engineering service providers are responsive to what the market demands are. But then when you go to the owners and operators of facilities, their focus is on productivity, that is cost and cycle time. And contractors and home builders, again, are heavily focused on cost and cycle time in addition to safety. So if you look at this, there are these competing interests and in many prior studies. By the way, the copies of these handouts are available outside so you can take up results on the website. Uh, many private, private studies have been conducted by the, the National Research Council and others. And, and so far as productivity trends are concerned, there's a general trend perception that the overall productivity trend in the industry has been not increasing for sure and probably has been declining at about 0.6% per year over that four decade period that Rob mentioned. While at the same time, the non-farm non productivity increase has been about 1.8% per year. So that's a huge uh, difference between the industry in general and the construction industry in particular. But very quickly, I want to hasten and say that there are many sectors of the industry that have actually made huge improvements. The industrial sector is the primary area. Through modularization and prefabrication, they have really adopted uh, ITs and uh, other kinds of advanced technologies. So uh, the three main causes are underinvestment in construction R&D, shift in the output mix, and slow growth in capital per worker. Um, and there is still considerable debate as to what industry level productivity measures uh, do we have and what information we have about that. Just to give you a sense of r and investment, that some years ago an estimate was made that it's less than one half of one percent of the revenue. So, uh, and two thirds of that is federally funded. Uh, through a bunch of uh, organizations. And much of that R&D uh, that the industry carries out is what would pass not as fundamental R&D or applied R&D, more D side going to scanning of information. So how do you change, or how do you change a mindset where you focus on technology's push and then 
companies kind of have to figure out if they want to accept that technology to a mindset where it's technology demand. We need this because it help us get this. Uh, that's a shift that I think we have to, to stimulate. So three factors that affect construction productivity that can be helpful is using industry best practices. Construction Industry Institute has been a pioneer in this regard. Um, in helping that industry use best practices and their performance, those who do use best practices perform far better than others. Technology utilization, the second factor, and I think the third factor, no one's mentioned it in any significant way, is skilled labor availability in the United States. And a study that we did some years ago said that the cost of inadequate interoperability in the U.S. capital facilities industry was $20 billion, roughly $19.2 billion per year. That's the cost of inadequate interoperability. So what is interoperability for construction? It would be the dynamic and seamless exchange of information that is accurate among all industry stakeholders throughout the facility life cycle. So that's where we have a problem. We have planners, designers, contractors, suppliers, uh, operators, owners, the whole nine yards. And if you look at the cost uh, elements, the owners and operators bore roughly $13 billion of that $20 billion cost. The architects and engineers had about $1.4 billion, and the general contractors and specialty fabricators had about $2.8 billion. So we actually asked the National Academy to carry out a study for us a few years ago, identify and prioritize the technologies, processes, and deployment for the greatest potential to significantly advance productivity and competitiveness of the U.S. industry. And they came back to us. Uh, this was a very impressive committee uh, of industry leaders, Ted Kennedy from EPA Kale Edit. Um, there was uh, the Draw Hill Construction was represented in the form of Norman Young. And they came back with five recommendations uh, for potential breakthrough improvements. One was widespread use of interoperable technology applications in the Second was improve job site efficiency through more effective interfacing of people, processes, materials, equipment, and IT. And this goes to the process of people element that was mentioned before. Greater use of prefabrication and pre-assembly and modularization and off-site fabrication processes, which in fact IT is a key enabler for that. Innovative demonstrations, which agencies like GSA and UD demonstrate often. And then effective performance measures that will help us not only measure what we do, but how can we improve. So if I talk about the trends, IT trends in this industry, uh, different sectors have different levels of adoption. Uh, yeah, most of that is driven by contract contractual models and life cycle metrics. I would say the process industry or industrial construction, they are usually the early adopters and leaders in the usage of technology. The commercial institution building sector is, is now adopting life cycle costing and BIM. And of course, organizations like GSA, DOD, hospital owners, and educational institutions are at the forefront in that, in that area. And infrastructure demand, which is all the public works construction, it's just starting to adopt it. So there's different phases of adoption. Interoperability is still a huge challenge in this industry. Coordination across industry efforts and agreement on viable instruments for adoption of the practices. And I'm going to skip over uh, some of the various ways in which BIM can truly be integrated. We have to talk about visualization, modeling, CADs, simulations, Specifications, procurement, construction management, facility management, demolition, knowledge bases, and laws and regulations. There's a lot to cover in the overall spectrum of BIM. We're just scratching the surface. And I would say an organization that's really been established by the industry is Fiatech. Um, in the late 90s, the Construction Industry Institute, which represents the top 100 contractors and owners in this country, 
with uh, partnering with this uh, through the strategic planning committee helped for Fiat Tech. The idea was Fiat Tech would be the way to, to realize a vision of a fully integrated and automatic, automated project process for the construction industry. And the idea was it would be like Semitech, where industry got together for the semiconductor industry in the early 80s, brought in some money of themselves, went to the hill and said, hey, we've got this money, this is a competitive issue for the nation, invest public resources in it, and Congress invested a huge amount. And the result of that was it helped us solve some critical problems in the semiconductor area and make the U.S. again a competitor, a world competitor in that area. So, Fiatech came out with a roadmap which I think is really uh, impressive. And that roadmap, which I'm sure Bob Weibel is going to talk about, really talks building beyond BIM. They're talking about total asset lifecycle information module and how industry can actually achieve a vision uh, to integrate IT. Within that framework, NIST has a mission to promote US innovation and industrial competitiveness. And we do that by targeting our investments in areas that will lose uh, economic impact. We, do deep, we have deep research expertise in many areas of technology, including lasers, of course, uh, with 3D imaging systems that was mentioned. Uh, we've actually worked pioneering the development of standards that industry can use that will lower the risks to companies and better assure quality. And we serve as an important, as a, we, we serve a role as a convener that facilitates collaboration between industry and government. So there are four areas of work we're doing now. Systems integration for construction applications, which is seeking to integrate engineering information systems using complex construction networks to improve life cycle performance. Smart construction systems to enable real-time monitoring, control, and optimization of on-site construction processes. Embedded intelligence in buildings to improve building operations to achieve energy efficiency, occupant comfort, and safety through the use of intelligent building systems. And smart utility infrastructure. And in fact, we're leading the development of smart grid standards for interoperability. Uh, to measure, control, and optimize the performance of utility grids at the subsystem, system, and end user levels. Um, I still want to conclude with just a few remarks on productivity metrics. The productivity metrics will impact project outcomes, will help, help establish uh, norms, and will also help in assuring excellence in project execution. However, measuring productivity is a challenge because we have to measure it at the task level, at the project level, and at the <coughs> industry level. Very different issues. Uh, metrics change as a function of the level of analysis and, and their heterogeneous outputs. So we have been working with the benchmarking and metrics committee of the Construction Industry Institute to analyze how technology utilization and best practices affect engineering and construction productivity. And the CII has come up with project level productivity measures based on the data they collected um, on anywhere from 16 to 50 projects. And we actually can track project level productivity with time using these metrics. And we're demonstrating how that can be done. We've also completed a comprehensive uh, study of construction productivity at, at the task project and industry levels and have produced a report that documents uh, what we found. So in conclusion, we at NIST are, we stand ready to work with industry uh, to help them achieve their vision. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Chef. Uh, and uh, Bob, talk about the attack. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, the roadmap, I won't bore you all by trying to hold up something you can't see from the back of the room, but it actually is in uh, Dr. Sunder's presentation. Uh, take a look at it. What we did at Fiatech was really sit there and look at 
through a retreat session, bringing together the, the parties that are in the Tech, which is the construction industry, the large process facility um, companies in the United States, a lot of people out of the oil and gas, but also companies like Target that, that own everything that they build. Uh, bring them all together and say, what is it we can do to have a fully integrated uh, system across the life cycle of buildings? What are the gaps that exist out there? And that really formulated over the past 10 years. About 75 different projects, we have 25 of them actively right now, addressing some of those pieces, including the part that I came to be a tech to bring was We've talked a lot about BIM, we've talked a lot about technology, we've talked about a lot of companies and GSA that are doing wonderful things, but the regulatory system in the United States is still stuck in the 1950s at best. Only 10% of the 30,000 jurisdictions in the United States apply IT to some aspect of their regulatory program. At best, it's the e-permitting, and that is just you can come up with BIM all right, you have 3D models, you can design with no paper, but you get the regulatory system and everything has to be hard copy printed out. You're stuck with the same overall liability issues that this country has faced that creates the competition between the various sectors. People not wanting to be, people being concerned with this whole new BIM technology, now what does that do with my contractual relationship as the architect, as the owner, as the subcontractor, as the supplier? All those issues. In the, in the foundation's issues list, if you go to the website, there are 23 different issues that the foundation here is, is working on. And I would say it boiled down to, when we talk about the problem, really to competitiveness and, from my perspective, public safety. We've seen in Japan, we've seen in a little bit of Katrina, what happens to our country or a country when there's truly a cataclysmic disaster. How fast can we rebuild? Can we afford to lose lots of California in terms of the economic engine of the country? A lot of the technologies that we've been talking about, bringing to the fore, the pieces are there. What does not really exist is a national forum, the venue, today is a start perhaps, to come together with all of the key stakeholders to say, how do we focus our resources to address these traditional barriers of a fragmented construction industry? We've got some leaders, we've got GSA, but GSA has a counterpart in all 50 states and four territories. At least one agency inside state governments responsible for state construction. We need to work to take what GSA is doing at the national level and translate that down through all 50 states and four territories. We've got a dialogue going in some sections of GSA with the National Association of State Facility Managers, people who run those programs, and that has to occur. What I'd like to touch largely on are some suggested solutions. I think we've dealt pretty well with problems. We have a lot of excellent research out of, the, out of NIST and, and the National Academies. We have uh, had some public hearings. Uh, we've had a forum that was run in March of last year, sponsored by uh, in Engineering News Research and in Engineering News Record uh, on Rock Hill uh, and the National Building Museum on talking about how do we bring together the construction industry to address truly large-scale natural disasters. That produced a recommend set of recommendations to Congress that had just gone absolutely nowhere. And basically, in the recommendations are this concept, the sustainability the revival of the U.S. economy, the issue of competitiveness, is absolutely linked to disaster resiliency. But we have the tools, we have the capability to get buildings up much more quickly, much more efficiently. We're working on, a, on, on developing an electronic plan review technology that just automatically takes a code, a building code, whatever the code is in the jurisdiction, and is able to do in 60 seconds a complete plan <coughs> check the building, as opposed to what's taking 60 days. That technology exists and is possible. We need to bring together, in whether you call it a summit, all of the stakeholders from the banking and financial industry on through everybody who's in this room uh, and representatives of our elected officials at different levels of government and really begin to hammer out what can we do. Maybe some of the recommendations that come out of here later on today 
can we do to stimulate the application of these technologies, proven technologies, inside the construction industry? The nice thing about Theotech is that we can bring the other diverse, in many, many ways, the economic competitors uh, to talk about in a related to the University of Texas, that we're not for profit, a safe place to come up with projects that they don't have to worry about restraining trade issues to start wrestling with some of these, some of these very real issues. Uh, and I think with that, I will yield. Yield the balance for me for your time. Thank you. Into and a certain amount of the design effort 
goes into putting the 1391 form together and then a cost. And we take that up to the hill and it goes, literally goes into our budget, project by project. And we get the authorization uh, from Congress and the appropriation. Well, we have then, we have just told the world what we think it's going to cost to build a building. So as Phil said to me earlier, we've played three of our five cards. We've got, so that's not from a negotiating standpoint, that's, you know, that's not a great strategy, but that's in the interest of public transparency, that's what we do. Then, next step, um, a, a Fort Bliss ha has no choice but to have the Army Corps of Engineers as their construction agent. The only other choice is NAVFAC, Naval Facilities Command, but the way it works in DOD, there is, and this is a DOD unique problem, this is not an industry-wide problem, but there is no, there's no choice. It's a, it's a monopoly, and, and by and large, it's, it's the Army Corps, and then if you're, if you're a Navy component, you can you, you use NAVFAC, but if you're Air Force or your Army, you use the Army Corps, and NAVFAC and the Army Corps charge a flat amount, 5.7% for U.S. facilities for their construction management services. There's no negotiating that amount. Maybe there is some informal, but by and large, that's a fixed amount. Uh, it, it, the, that results in the large construction projects subsidizing small construction projects because the, the cost, the construction management costs of a small project, I think, are, are disproportionately high. But there's a, a, a general um, acceptance of that across the board amount. That 5.7% that charge applies whether the project comes uh, over budget or not. So at Fort Belvoir, as part of BRAC, we built a $900 million hospital. It turned out to be a billion dollar hospital. It was $100 million over budget. And the, and the core as construction manager took 6% of that, of that overage, that, that budget overage. So that's a really messed up incentive uh, incentive system. <laughs> well, um, that's like double what the private sector charges. <laughs> So that, yeah, that's, an, that's another question about whether, yeah, because that is a, it's a commercial function that the core and NAFAC are, are playing. So is that a, is that a justified price? Then, then here, here is where it starts to sound like the, the broader issue. Is the, does that construction agent represent me, the owner, the commander at, at Fort Bliss? And, um, it, it's not clear that they that they do, and I got a lot of insight from Barry Lepatner's book about that. And his feeling is if 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 a construction agent is paid a flat rate as opposed to being paid uh, in some way being at risk, uh, they're not they're not representing the owner. They don't have they don't have skin in, in the game, and that's sort of been my uh, been my conclusion. There there there's also a and, and this is a huge issue. It's a first cost versus life cycle cost issue. The core builds or oversees the construction, but they don't maintain buildings. Other, another part of the army maintains this new building at Fort Bliss, not the core. The core's incentive is to get something in on time and on budget, um, but the the operational costs are are not factored in. Phil gave me a great example earlier when he was the uh, design manager at National Airport and he uh, initially was going to install a bunch of variable speed fans and then realized they, they were a lot more expensive. They would reduce O&M costs, but that was not part of the budget for the design of the airport. That was somebody else's problem. So that classic kind of color of money issue. Uh, and it, it's, it's a big problem for us, and it takes this organizational form of the core, Army Corps, and AFAC worrying about construction costs, but not the life cycle costs. This is this the broader um, structural issue in the, in the construction industry. Rob asked us not to uh, get off onto um, green buildings and energy efficiency, which I love to, to talk about, but I can't entirely stay away from it because that, that has been my lens into this. It has been in an effort to push uh, energy efficiency and sustainability that I've seen the, the, the problems with, with this. Um, and the, uh, we, <coughs> we brought uh, Amory Lovins and his Rocky Mountain Institute in to look at a $5 billion, $4 billion effort we have underway 
to um, uh, rebuild and build new schools, 100 schools on military bases. School, these are schools that we own. Uh, $4 billion, and they are, they are to be models of energy efficiency and sustainability. And we've brought in a great set of, of architects, and uh, you know we're off to a good start, but RMI's conclusion was that you need to have an independent, uh, first of all, the, the entity overseeing the project doesn't have the expertise in, uh, in construction. This is the Department of Defense Education Agency. They don't have expertise in construction, much less trying to do sustainability and energy efficiency. And uh, their advice was you need an independent construction agent to represent the owner because the, the core's interest will be getting this in on time on budget. That's good. But the design elements, the, the, the elements in the design that will um, achieve sustainability and lower costs over time are likely to be, to be sacrificed. So more, much more attention to the design process and to getting, um, to getting the design right with an eye to life cycle costs, less emphasis on sort of a low bid approach to, uh, to, to the construction budget uh, narrowly. So, um, that's kind of my, my perspective on this. I think I'll say one, one other thing. Uh, I think that uh, in terms of what the government can do, and I, I, I'm here more as a in receive mode more than transmit mode, because I think there, I don't know what, I think there are things I can do, and I'm not, I need to, uh, I don't know what they are. But I think government's role as a convener is very powerful. I was, um, involved somewhat in Semitech, and I think that's a great example. And it, it is a, it's a nice example. I don't know how, how relevant it is, but that was a case of where the semiconductor equipment manufacturers were weak. Um, they were not, and the semiconductor, the chip producers had a lot, they were, they were doing a lot of investment in how to produce improve semiconductor manufacturing equipment, but they weren't sharing that with the equipment manufacturers because then the equipment manufacturers would incorporate it and the chip producers would lose their competitive edge. So there was a prisoner's dilemma problem that was solved by bringing them on, under one roof. And DARPA, DOD's DARPA, was the funded half of uh, Semitech. And I think it, it, is, it is a, a wonderful example. Now, it took the semiconductor industry basically being at the point where they went over a cliff to get Semitech funded at a good level. It took Robert Moist, the co-inventor of the integrated circuit, uh, to, uh, to chair it, to pull together these intensely competitive chip manufacturers and get them all together in Austin, Texas. Uh, but I think it was very, very successful in shoring up the semiconductor equipment industry, which was the weak one. Um, and then one last thing. I think we can play a, uh, a big role in, in, in as a demonstrator and validator of new technology broadly defined. And here I'll go back to something Dean alluded to in his his remarks. We are um, the Department of Defense has a very strong test and evaluation culture. We are big big believers in dem what we call dem -val, demonstration and validation of technology that we have developed or that others have developed. Uh, before we field it. It's one reason that uh, DOD is historically such a strong innovator. We, we have, this stuff has to work for us in the field and we have a lot of, um, uh, this, this emphasis on test and evaluation is very strong. One of the recommendations from the NIST report was uh, more focused on, uh, on the role of demonstrations. It, we, we have, uh, we're doing this in a big way with both environmental technology and next generation technology for building energy efficiency, also microgrids and storage. Uh, it's just huge problems, not just technical problems, but regulatory and operational issues that, that you discover when you test this stuff. Uh, but there's a classic market failure. Uh, this, this is the first user of new technology bears, uh, bears a high cost and makes no additional return, at least in the energy efficiency area. And so uh, government in here is taking on the role. We as the owner of 300,000 buildings are saying we, 
we want to take on that risk of being the first user. And I think we can we can really make a contribution there. I'm not sure why, or maybe Shan can explain why we don't do that in the in the building technology area itself. Uh, I have a, I, there, there may be a reason, but I'm not sure what it is. But anyway, I think uh, demonstrations broadly defined uh, is, a, is an important role that we can play. I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Bob. Uh, wow, this is really good. Um, my head is spinning, so I'll um, first uh, I want to say um, I, I, I appreciate the comments about what GSA has done, and so I will. It actually helps me because I don't have to go through the part of what I prepared that brags about what GSA is doing. Um, but, I, but I will say that um, the federal government, the civilian side of the federal government construction mostly, has, a, has an interesting history in kind of innovation. I mean, the federal government as early as the 1840s was promoting fireproof construction, mostly um, iron frame and brick buildings, and, uh, and adopted it openly and overtly. The Secretary of the Treasury, who ran the building operation at the time, said that the government was going to accept it. Um, in, the, in the 70s, after the Arab oil embargo, the GSA, uh, well, basically building crummy buildings, at least otherwise, was adopting uh, motion sensor technology and some other things to try to drive energy costs down. Um, we have, in, I'm glad we recognize it, we have worked really hard on BIM. We've done, we have done laser scanning. Um, the one thing, I'm just going to try to throw a couple of bunch of issues on the table. Uh, in our Chicago Federal Center, we did a language scan of the product and found out, to, no surprise to most anybody here, that uh, what we thought the as-built conditions were kind of close to what the real as-built conditions were. Unfortunately, with laser scanning, we could find that out before we got too far. We're, we are an integrated builder operator in a way, so we should avoid some of the problems that Darcy alluded to where the, the core builds, but then the post commander has to operate. Um, where the post engineer has to operate and doesn't talk to the construction side of the core. Um, we we are uh, we do when we build a building we do operate in them and we have tenants and tenants move in and federal tenants move in and they move out. Uh, we're mostly self financing. We charge rent and uh, we have to make uh, net income funds from operations because that's our only source of capital funding to maintain to do the capital expenditure on our inventory and in some cases to build new. So we have. All of those incentives align, and yet still have to say that, to be honest, our, we're only now taking BIM to the facilities management side and saying, boy, once you really know what's going on there, you can experiment with different things once the building is built and try to figure out what's working. Um, another side of this, which I'm, again, I'm sorry, this is on the, a little bit, it's not green, it's just operating the buildings, is um, we are working hard to get a single backbone, an integrated backbone in our buildings for uh, energy conservation. We have a, many of you know, we have a solicitation on the, on the street for a, uh, what we're calling the Fast 50, uh, it's government procurement process, so it's not going to call it the Slow 50, but a Fast 50, uh, our Fast 100 buildings, our largest energy users, and the idea is to network them and try to mine the kind of information you can get about building operations you can't yet get just having one um, asset manager at a time looking at how the buildings operate. But once you do that, you can obviously go the other way and A, start uh, figuring out well, what's working in your buildings, what isn't, what are little tweaks you can make to make things work aside from, uh, you know, are the filters all clogged in the uh, air conditioning units, but are you turning on the air conditioning too early in the morning, too late uh, to get the building up and maximize, uh, optimize your energy usage. But the other side of it, which I want to put on the table, is the ability to tell the tenants what their impact on energy usage and building operations is. So in our San Francisco federal building, we'll have a, we have a large video hall, and we have the capability, because we have lots of data points in the building from our sensors, uh, to tell people on different floors, at least, how their energy usage last week compared to their energy usage the week before. Uh, we're hoping to foster a kind of a friendly competition. Uh, to, to create uh, better outcomes. Um, but let me go to the, but let's, let's talk about the, the, the issue at hand. And I was thinking of, I was just uh, thinking of a couple of things. One, it's interesting about productivity. Um, most of us who do construction still go to a construction site. I did it myself just a couple of weeks ago. And you look around and you say, 
uh, were supposed to be done 30 days from now, there aren't enough workers on the site. Now, there aren't very many other industries in America in which you still say, wow, there's just not enough labor attached to the capital. And they say everybody's trying to go the other ratio, but we all say none, not enough workers on the site. There's something wrong with that. Second, uh, but I don't quite know what it is, except uh, because I'm going to talk about some other things. We're, we're a weird industry when it comes to modularity. I thought uh, when you talked about the Johnson years, you were also going to talk about Operation Breakthrough at HUD. The idea that you could um, modularize housing and basically a, ended up looking like trailers, which don't have a really good image for a lot of Americans, but a way to sort of manufacture housing, truck it to a site. Um, you, you were an interesting construction industry that way. We are modularized in some things. We don't, we don't build the boilers and the chillers on the site. We truck them or barge them or whatever uh, to the site and we install them. We don't do that on very many other things in the building. It is partly, and we all know this, partly because soil conditions can differ, the configurations of the buildings can differ. And what people have tried to get around that by, again, going back to modular uh, building, you know, you end up with sort of kit of parts things that A, uh, there's a design industry, and many of us, I describe myself as an architecture groupie, um, believe somehow saps the human spirit, and that's not to, to be discounted. Um, but second, it often just doesn't work because, because functions are more specific than that. Um, I, I'd like to suggest one thing is going to drive us in a different direction in the commercial office industry, and mostly what I build is the commercial, uh, basically commercial office buildings, although they may be a laboratory in cases like the Food Drug Administration or a courthouse, which is pretty specialized. Um, but on the other hand, we're seeing more and more um, when people are going to collaborative office space, uh, there are green demands on that, both reducing the amount of square footage everybody uses, because if you want to reduce your green footprint, the uh, best thing to do is reduce your footprint. Second, um, because of the need to get daylight, because people work better together in teams, because IT allows different kinds of, of uh, office work. There's a, one change going on in the building industry is that we're going to see a lot more just, just vanilla open space, fewer built-ins, offices and other kinds of things in the buildings, um, and more opportunity, and, and more of uh, some of the IT infrastructure and even some of the HVAC infrastructure is going to be carried in the furniture itself, which in its own way is a form of uh, modularizing, if that's a verb, um, some of the building industry. Um, what of the, um, what, what are the other notes I just make, and um, Bob mentioned it, is that uh, it is true. If you if you um, talk to the the building industry as a whole, it's not only fragmented. Not only do we have small uh, businesses, um, and I'm going to get back to it very quickly into uh, some impediments in the government to, to innovating that, that we found. Um, but not only the very small businesses, but some of the really big players in the business aren't really much interested in this at all. It's hard to know why. But I was at a, a conference last week for the commercial commercial mortgage-backed securities business. Uh, they don't talk about construction costs, construction productivity at all. First of all, a lot of them are just sort of flipping buildings and you know it's existing product and um, you know they've managed to securitize the whole thing. But their interest um, interest spreads. And if you talk to most of the really big players, the financiers in this business, they're not thinking much about the underlying building product except where's it located. Uh, how much do I have to invest in it to keep it running to get up to get the highest rent possible? And what are interest rates? And it's all it's almost all interest rates all the time. And if you really want to know who controls the building industry, at least on the private side, uh, it's it's the people who lend the money or put in the equity. You'd think that they'd be thinking about their return on equity, which could be higher if they could get uh, you know I don't know. I can't figure out in the macro sense how this would play out in the long run if buildings cost less to build and got done faster, or whether you can maintain the same level of rent or whether they would maintain the same level of return. But uh, it's an interesting thing that we ought to talk about with them. So one, um, a couple of other things I'll just note about uh, the government as an innovator. I mean, we do believe, and Dorothy and I get to talk about this a lot, we, we do understand that particularly now, and it's kind of unfortunate in a way, we are the big kahunas in the uh, building industry. There's not enough construction going on otherwise. Um, 
not even in the in, on the infrastructure side, and I think we ought to try to bring in the, the heavy construction people too. We have a tendency to leave out the transit, water system uh, people who who also um, need this and adopted a lot of technology. But um, we can, in GSA when I was uh, my first tour of duty, we decided that we were going to require, uh, we got away with this, we were going to require our contractors um, to show that they were able to produce, to recycle a certain amount of construction site waste. And quite honestly, my concern, this will go into some of the barriers we have in the government, my concern was that while I figured that some of the larger contractors, even though it didn't appear that they were doing much about construction site waste at the time, would figure it out if we were putting out a solicitation, you worry about whether the small folks um, are, will, will be able to afford something new just to try to apply for a government contract. And if they can't, there is um, heck to pay politically because they will, their, this is America, they have their, and thank God, and they have their right to go to the Congress um, and say, or the Small Business Administration, say we're not being treated fairly. We're being asked to bear an infrastructure cost that um, we can't afford. And nobody, by the way, in the Congress, if I ask, is prepared to say, so tell you what, Bob, next building you build, we'll add in another 5, 10% for, for new IT or stuff like that. Um, because how can it be that you're now projecting the next courthouse is going to cost $400 a foot when the last one cost 375 Well, why is that? Well, I'm trying some new things. Well, to be honest, it's not even in my authorizing legislation. DOD can do R&D at least on airplanes. They can gut through with a B-22 Osprey that doesn't seem to work for 20 years. You finally actually feel the thing no matter what. Um, but for us, uh, I don't, we don't get that chance. So um, a, a couple of, just again, a couple of things. One is we are, for example, we are, we are running something called the Green Proving Ground. There are these, uh, as, as usual, we thought we were really a big deal because we figured out a way to spend a million dollars on it. Dorothy said, yeah, my budget's really down. I'm spending 30 million on mine. Um, but we have, found, we have found a way to try out some technologies on our buildings and said to, and this is important to us, I don't want to just, I don't want to stop without leaving this unsaid. We are requiring people to, um, who are offering us some new technologies that we're going to try out on sites, whether it's a new form of um, solar cell or a new way of censoring in a, in a data center. We just found one that we think has a great uh, bang for the buck. But we're requiring them to be A, open source, uh, and B, to allow us to post our evaluation of how well it performed um, on data.gov. Which is a risk for some of the private sector who's trying out a new thing because, in essence, we might, with the help of the national labs who are doing the evaluation, trash their product. Um, so it's a risk, but I think that there are uh, a lot of people willing to do it. Anyway, the other the other problem is um, I, I, I've got this. We have this kind of dream that we'll find some technologies that really work that will change whether it's um, energy conservation or um, the basic way in which buildings are built and then be able to incorporate them uh, into our performance specifications for our buildings. Uh, but as you might suspect, if we find something that seems kind of proprietary or that adds upfront costs, to go back to what everybody else has said, we may have a problem incorporating it for, for two reasons. One is uh, upfront costs, particularly in this kind of a budget climate, are pretty bad. And second, um, each procurement is its own procurement. And so it's very difficult for us to say we found a new sensor for data centers that will um, actually create the economies we're, we're hoping for. Um, so use this one. I mean, we, we do have ways around it. We can say we've, we, we know it's, we're, it's possible to achieve this economy. So if you can match it, go ahead and do it. But it, but it means to somebody who is taking a risk to offer something to us and maybe going to extra expense, they may not realize the same kind of return. We can't guarantee that we'll capture it then itself may may give it innovation. Great, thank you. Thank you, that was great, uh, all five speakers. Uh, let me sort of delve down a little bit into, into some solutions and um, maybe we can try to start for a few minutes on what are some actionable things that we can change that would move the ball down the field? You know, one of the things that I would say, and I'm maybe the 
only one on the panel that's allowed to say uh, this is completely uh, heterodox and, and, and totally uh, uh, politically incorrect statement. Uh, but I think we should just have an official policy in the U.S. government that we should at best be indifferent to firm size in this industry and at, uh, at, at worst be indifferent to firm size and at best actually promote consolidation. Uh, Bob, your point about, you know, we impose some rule and we exempt a small company from adopting, from having to comply with the rule, all we're really doing is keeping in place small and efficient producers who should not be in the marketplace if they can't comply with the rule. That's obviously not everybody's view, but it's certainly my view. Uh, now, the reason I say that, without, I'm not really trying to be crass here, but, but the reason I say that is scale is probably the most important factor, I think, in getting to where we want to be. And if we have a set of policies that essentially exempt small companies, um, we're just going to do that good. One area that I know a small amount about in, in this, and most of it I know not very much about, but is in the transportation area. Uh, and one of the things that states have done, a few states, uh, but most states have not done, is that they, they've shifted in transportation budgeting towards design, build, maintenance. Uh, in other words, they get a company to design the road, uh, they build it, and then they maintain it. And there's a contract for maintaining the road for 30 years. Uh, part of the reason they do that is you have really good technology to judge how well the road is being maintained. Now, the advantage of doing that is you, you do two really important things, uh, I think, with that new kind of process uh, of buying construction services. One is you, um, is you basically give an incentive, this is, this is Dorothy's point, you give an incentive to make, put a little more capital in up front that have much lower life cycle costs uh, because the, there's one company that's going to bear it all and they're on the hook for it. Uh, but the second thing you do is you end up moving towards scale. It's only bigger companies that can usually afford to take those kinds of risks. They then want to innovate, both in construction and in maintenance, and you get an overall I mean, better functioning eco ecosystem. So I guess a question I would have for anybody on the panel is, do you think that kind of notion uh, where we could move to more design building, does that make sense in any of the areas that you all are working on? And if so, uh, how could we get there? Do you want to ask the supply side or the demand side? Uh, you want to start with the supply side and then we go to the demand side. Well, I will say that, at least from our business's perspective, we're already starting to see that consolidation in our customers. Yeah. Um, the construction, at least construction, on the construction and design sides of the house, we're starting to see some consolidation. And, you know, and in, for infrastructure projects, it's interesting to compare these jobs that are hospitals versus roadways, right? Because roadways are, I mean, they're not very complex to design. The performance characteristics are pretty straightforward, and it's easy to measure the maintenance. When you get to a bigger idea like a hospital, measuring its performance characteristics is a much tougher proposition. Nonetheless, design and construction companies are starting to consolidate. And the problem is that when you get, the, the problem is the nature of the industry is such as even if the designers consolidate and the construction management types consolidate, the projects are still are still built by what we call guys in trucks with dogs, right? Little companies that drive up, they get out, they get up, they get out, they get out well. the, Trying to drive consolidation by standards is going to be very, very difficult because there's so many tiny little moving pieces. I don't know, Jim, what do you think about this? Question? I, I, I mean, I think the trend where it's possible has been to move towards design build integration for sure, but, but also to, to some degree maintenance, probably not as much. Uh, but I think as, as my colleagues on, uh, on the government agencies have mentioned, that within the federal procurement system, trying to do some of those things is very difficult, if not impossible. So, um, you know, I think um, that structural change is going to be taking quite a bit of in inventive efforts on the part of a large number of people to actually want to happen. Uh, I think integration in general is a good idea. But whether or not it means fewer small companies, I'm not sure I necessarily agree that's necessarily the way to go because it's in the small companies, for the most part, are, are focused on the home building side of the construction industry, not as much on the heavy construction side. Um, but, but it's maybe not completely I, I do have this idea. You know, the way the construction industry is, um, <coughs> is basically constructed is large construction firms don't have their own internal 
external workforce. Right. They don't and uh, <clears throat> right, so they have all these subcontractors. And so the way that we do influence all of that is, is if we can, is by um, tightening the standards we have for the large construction companies who, to be honest, the object on our major product is, is who, we're, who we're dealing with. So they've got to try to integrate the, the sub. On the other hand, you know, the problem is that the pipeline isn't very predictable. We're not a very good example. We have five and a half billion dollars of recovery act money to go out and build and mostly renovate our buildings, and then last year we got 82 million. So you know, it's not much in anybody's interest to organize themselves to to um, serve the GSA client because we can kick the props out from under them in any given time. Having said that, I still think that it's the, con the construction companies made to do that. And one, one analogy, I don't quite know how it plays out, but uh, it occurred to me. Um, we're all in the building uh, operating business worried about how computerized our systems are now. We're having to educate building managers who used to be a man or woman who carried a couple of wrenches around and really was good with their hands. For people who now, and this is true, you know, literally walk around with laptops uh, checking out their building systems. And they really need to know those diagnostics. And we know that we're ahead of some of them, but we're retraining a lot of folks. So I guess what I'm suggesting is large construction companies would have to go to their subs and say, if you're going to work for Clark or Turner or somebody like that, you're going to have to be awfully tech savvy to work on this site. That's, I know I got away from your question about the extent to which we're integrating the facilities management as well as the design build. Um, I don't, I don't know that we'll get there. I mean, I, for us, we ought to, but don't do a terribly good job of it, of integrating our own facilities management folks with the design up front. We, are, we all have, forget the technology, we all still have those awful moments when you walk into the building and it's ready for the dedication and somebody looks up and says, we're going to change that light bulb. Change a little light bulb, we're going to have to buy it, you know, bring a scissor flip and, you know, rope off the lobby and we really have that. I'd like to get a little bit about this comment with, uh, uh, in the sense that the skilled workforce shortage is a big issue when you talk to senior folks in the construction industry all across the country. And if you are going to talk about high scale, high wage jobs, uh, you're going to have to do something to that mix of labor that is used in construction products if we're going to have a systemic change in that industry. But you have a Well, one thing that is happening. It is, is, is BIM becomes richer, and it's now being applied to operation and maintenance back to the owner. And we're seeing changes inside the AGC BIM forum, which now not only has AGC in it, but the American Institute of Architects, but they're really looking at the construction documents and really talking about changing the nature of shared liability that will help drive us towards some of this happening. You're, you're not going to get to the shared liability changes unless someone's willing to adjust the structures. You know, I was, we were talking before we started that, um, you know, the, the, the Prime Minister of Great Britain declared at the beginning of his term that he was going to make UN, uh, UK construction 20% more efficient. That was one of his objectives. And one of the uh, policy discussions that's being talked about is this idea that the design and construction team doesn't own the asset and run it for 30 years, but it has to run it for the first three years after construction. So for three years after the job's done, you have to actually have, to, you actually have to run the job for the customer or the client, which means that you have to upskill all these guys who drive up to the job in their trucks or their dogs, because they're going to have to take the laptops and run the mechanical systems and demonstrate to the client that the building actually operated in the mode that they asserted during design. That would be a radical shift, but you have to blow up about, you know, 40 years of procurement policy to make that happen. I mean, that sort of leads to, I feel, I think a really important point, which is here you have a Cameron, the Cameron government, which is a, a Tory party, conservative party, and they have made this a national issue to focus on the particular sector. Um, why couldn't we, or could, should we, and maybe I'll ask Bob and Bray, you know, what if we had a, a federal buildings council or construction council, DOD, DSA, HUD, and DOT at least, and maybe MNIST, and really think about what are the kinds of things that the federal government as a, both a buyer and, and, and as a funder. Uh, and then my other idea, which I know 
you probably both hate, uh, which is uh, why do we have kind of like an SBIR tax uh, on all federal construction, maybe like two tenths of a percent, uh, which almost all come out of Jordan's budget. Uh, but take that money and, uh, and then put it into an, uh, an R&D fund that would, would sort of lower everybody's cost in the end of the out here. So those are two thoughts. I'd just would love to hear your thoughts on them. The, um I, I'm not opposed to the, to the first one, certainly. I think that that makes sense. I do think, I, I whispered to, to Rob that I, I don't totally agree that uh, this sector is not subject to foreign competition. It is increasingly the Bay Bridge in, uh, in, in California. And they imported large parts of the, the bridge from China. I mean, I, I you know, never even occurred to me that something like that would be subject to foreign competition, but it is, and I think that will help uh, increase uh, pressure and get and get attention. Um, I, I think it makes sense to get. I don't, you know, Bob and I relate largely on the energy issues and ATFP. We've never really talked about about this issue. This is a good. Um, SBIR. My, my reaction there just is when you tax agencies, they and the problem with SBIR is that agencies don't take it <coughs> seriously because it is a they view it as a tax, so they don't take how the money is spent seriously, as opposed to how DARPA looked at um, at Semitech, where they had a, a real stake in it, or how NIST, NIST yeah, relates to Biotech. Uh, we'll say rather than a. Tax. I mean, as I said, we don't have the authority to do straight out R&D, but I'm referring to some of the stuff we're doing is applied research, uh, so I can get around that. And um, don't tell anybody. And the, uh, but I, I, there's an, um, our administrator, Martha Johnson, uh, is, is who was, uh, who's worked at places like uh, Cummins Engine, as well as uh, Computer Sciences Corporation, so she's one of the gamut. Um, talks about three important things, customer excellence for us, uh, customer intimacy rather, operational excellence, and innovation. So innovation is part of our triad. We're working hard to figure out a way that we can capture some value to try new things like the improving ground, we have, um, you know, smart buildings. And uh, so I, I think we embrace it. Second, I do think there's actually a, a window uh, on getting all the construction agencies together. Here's where I think it comes from, that I think we ought to Darth and I think we ought to conspire and maybe work that way well with us with DOT. Um, yes. so since he's a distinguished alum on that. Um, I, I, you know, President Obama said he discovered what many of us kind of knew. I'm a political appointee, so I want to say this carefully. But he said, I discovered there's no such thing as a shovel ready project. And there are various reasons. For that, I mean, there are there are like you know potholes that you can you know get the paving crews going in two days, um, but for the, for our industry, there aren't all that many. Even GSA renovation plans that were on the shelf for several years turned out needed to be upgraded in lots of ways. You know, in some cases they were so old that the people didn't make that kind of chiller anymore. You know, we had to have, we had to at least do that. So I think there's an opportunity maybe to say to some people um, in the administration. You know, the next time around, I mean, this industry took a little bit of a black eye. When I, when I worked in the Senate in the 1980s, and there were early 80s, there was a recession. The very first thing people talked about was big public works projects. They don't talk about it the same way anymore. The economists know that by the time you move public work projects out into, uh, you know, get them, get them moving, you probably missed the point at which you needed to create jobs. But that sort of resonated, and that's a danger for, uh, for us. So maybe that's the... Maybe that's a little leaper. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, just, I wonder why somebody who looks at this problem globally in the other markets that we work in, that the conversation here in the U.S. about the correlation between construction effectiveness and economic competitiveness is non-existent. I mean, you know, Bob, you started to make it, but I mean, not that I would ever in any other way compare the U.S. government with the Singaporean government. But when you go to Singapore, they have decided that they construction competitiveness is critical to their economic success. And so they created an entire infrastructure around systematically improving the construction industry, around technology standards, training. They've, they've made that correlation. It makes the, the political argument a lot less complex. And for some reason, we've never been able to make that argument here. We can't run the economy unless we have schools and hospitals and roads and, 
and the you know the ACC guys with the grid on the infrastructure. But we don't we don't talk about that stuff. We, we just it's not interesting. And then you know to go to your other example, Bob, I, I was teaching at Harvard Business School uh, last couple of months ago. I'm getting a big argument about the construction industry and what the economic opportunity is there just to attack the productivity problem. It's hundreds of billions of dollars. How many of you hotshot Harvard MBA students are going into anything related to the building industry? The answer was not one, not one hand run. I gave out a lot of really low grades and I left. How many of you are going into other than finance? That's the last problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, one other, one other thing. Um, you know, I, I used to work for Senator Boyd, and I've always said that an awful lot of issues that became uh, public issues became issues because we figured out a way to measure them. And I think that um, you know, if, as, as long as we're uh, if, as long as we're talking about this, and you you have to understand how building industry, uh, you have a problem. Americans really do respond well. Uh, you can see this, the sense about air pollution changed a lot when whether it was actually accurate or not when we came up with a air quality index. And then day by day, Americans love to measure, right? You know, it's like a whole sports thing, you tell the wins or loses. You get up today and say air quality is 92. Mm, that's better than yesterday. It was 80. You know, it was worse, better than yesterday. It was 98, whatever. So um, somehow we need to be able to measure this and decide what it is we're talking about. We don't even do that well. I'll say that we're talking about it inside GSA. That's the question. So, on average, 60 some years worth of construction experience, how long does it take us to build a 100,000 square foot building? We don't know. Um, there are reasons we don't, we don't want to know, and we don't want to tell anybody, but we ought to, we ought to start getting to that. And maybe there's some other measure of productivity competitiveness. This, this is where I think the, the, uh, the energy lens, the green, green construction. Uh, perspective is also uh, really important. Construction may not be sexy, green buildings, that's very sexy. I had, I had uh, dinner with a group of aerospace CEOs a year ago, and one of them said, you know, we can't recruit the best and brightest into the aerospace industry anymore, out of MIT's engineering school, whatever. They want to go design the next Chevy Bolt. And I mean, what is great, you know, <laughs> That's a real switch, but I think this, you know, I think the construction industry, if it's, you know, green construction, I think that's that's similarly appealing. Sure. I, I will say that, you know, there are pockets of really excellent work in the construction industry going on. I think that uh, if you look at high-rise construction worldwide, we are leading the world in high-rise construction, not really in the U.S., but we're helping the engineering of all the buildings that are going up in Asia, and the Middle East. Uh, companies like SOM, Leslie Robertson, Weidinger, Jonathan Domasetti, we're in the lead uh, worldwide. So where do we goof up? And in terms of construction, productively, the Empire State Building was, I think, put together in a couple of years. Uh, all, it's when it was originally constructed. When it was originally put together, yeah. 14 months. Uh, and, and of course, the systems were not as complex as the ones we use now. There was no IT in the, in the building and so on. But, uh, but I would say that the main structural issue we have in the construction industry that kind of uh, makes it difficult to do innovation is the project-centric nature of the industry. You heard uh, Dorothy talk about how she gets approval for projects. Uh, it's submit every project of the hill. The hill decides which project to fund or not to fund. Uh, this is true across the industry. Uh, folks come together to work on a project, and then when the project is done, they disband. And of course, the, 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 the low level workers are, are, are fungible, so they kind of work from project to project. And so there's no constancy. So I think investment in RD, when you go and talk to a company about investing in RD, their revenue's focus is project by project. It's not by some corporate vision of RD and, and, and so forth. So, I think we have to change that, and, and part of it is because it's a very commodity-oriented industry. When you get to the construction of projects, they are very, they want to get it done fast, they want it done quickly, they want to have, they don't risk the liability associated with risks, and they want to get it get out as fast as they can. And so that's really the focus, and I think we have to build, somehow deal with that if we're going to actually make the changes we're talking about. I want to open it up to folks. Uh, I just want to say on the speeding, the main reason we did this event is because I'm personally impacted by the construction industry. There's 
tear down to rebuild right across the street from me. Every morning for six months, I get woken up six days a week at 7 a.m. I really don't know why it takes that long to build this house. We meet a couple of guys there. Pardon me. Did you? Is it an AutoCAD design of the house? Unbelievable. There's no signs being uh, completed anytime soon. Right here in the back. Yeah. First, thank you. Can you identify yourself also? Anita Valentine, Division 21. Uh, thank you for putting this together. This has been really fascinating. I wanted to ask you if you would, Mr. Kemp, to elaborate on the point about measurement. Because I agree wholeheartedly in principle, and yet for the last at least five years, we've had in the mainstream media plenty of statistics about the miles of sewer systems uh, that are deteriorating, the water systems, the bridges that are on the verge and overdue for uh, maintenance and overhaul and rebuilding, and yet that has not translated into any sort of ground flow of support for public spending on, on infrastructure. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, I may be out of my depth, I don't have any polling data, but ask most of your friends who aren't in the building industry what they think about public works crews. Ask them to decide to describe a public works crew. And unfortunately, they'll take it from the people who trim trees and pave, pave the roads to work on major infrastructure projects like in Washington, you know, kind of uh, getting, changing our uh, combined sewer overflow system. And what they'll tell you is, well, I don't know what that means. That means, you know, four people standing around and one guy shoveling asphalt into a hole. People don't like the government. Public is kind of a bad word. So public works, public infrastructure doesn't have a terribly good connotation. And um, that's why I think the measurement is important until we can say to people, hey, listen, we've got the numbers that show that your dollars are being well spent, that it's, that it's there's a, uh, however we do it, the ratio of spending to people employed or the, if, but, but more importantly, how much money gets spent for whatever to get it done is really important. And we're, we kind of lost um, that argument. There are lots of things, and I don't want to get into the politics of it, but you know, people have a sense it takes forever to get permits, it takes for environmental issues, which we fully support, but it means that Senator Winnegan also used to say, think about this, that um, when they built the first IRT subway line in 1904 in New York, they announced it and opened the line, I believe it was within 22 months. So, so you know, we're not talking about anymore, huh? Measuring the impact. Yeah, and somehow you gotta, we gotta change that. Let me go here. Yeah, uh, more county, among other things, I'm currently on the Washington Metro Board, but I've done other better things. Well, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Bob's comment about rebuilding in the context of Katrina Fukushima rung a bell with me because that's what we have to do with everything. So that's kind of a fast forward, we've got to do it all at once, but by the same token, we have to do it for everything. As we think about this integrated process, can we include the long term life cycle, not just maintain maintenance, but technology refresh and the ability to rebuild at the end? And we can't move out of our building, come back a few years later. If it's a power plant, if it's a water treatment plant, if it's a transfer system, we have to keep operating and figure out how to rebuild it. We have to think 30 years ahead of what technology would be like, but is it possible to task this collective process to think about that as well? Uh, I, think, I think indeed it is. It's just getting the right players in the room, tearing off their cell phones, <laughs> and concentrating on the issue. I mean, the Japanese have been forced into this. And all of us think that the you know, Japanese high technology, they did not use computers at all in doing the damage assessments. It was all done on paper forms. It took them three and a half months to just do 90 buildings that were still standing after the tsunami to assess the, whether or not they could put the buildings back together. That's ridiculous. You know, we've got the technology, we did it after Katrina in, in Louisiana to be able to make those assessments almost instantaneously and send the data up to Sacramento, in the case of California. So it can be done. I mean, how much thinking can we do up front? So we'll be able exactly. To but you want to do that, that the, the, the way projects are conceptualized, whether it's by the government or by private owners, has to be redefined. 
Instead of a project being conceptualized as chunk one design, chunk two construction, hand over keys, begin litigation and prayer. Right? <laughs> the project has to be defined in terms of its entire performance horizon. And, the, and there's a whole lot of discussion in the US building industry right now around a topic called alternative project delivery, which is blowing up these standard contract models and business models and replacing them with these wider horizon discussions. Ironically, much of that discussion came out of the information technology transition that was going on because people began to see, well, we've got all these collaborative tools that let us work together in different ways. Let's try some different contract structures. But you know, they are using a lot of technology to do the Fukushima reactor, they're using a lot of our stuff. That was, I mean, that's desperation. That's not good prior planning. I think there are a few other comments to be made here because if we are talking about 2.2 trillion to be invested or some horizon and, and being invested the way being invested 50 years ago uh, for the highway system or 100 years ago for the uh, subway system in New York, the chances of it being required to replace another 50 years or 100 years are very high. And let me tell you, the cost of rebuilding in 100 years is going to be impossible for us to do. So, it's going to be very important that as we rebuild, we don't build the way we've always been building. We have to build with a very different mindset in terms of durability, functionality, um, uh, adaptability to the environment. Resilience has to be a key word in all of this. Sustainability has to be a key word. Uh, and those two factors are going to change the mindset. We have to think about black swan events when we design these facilities, not just the minimum standards that are required in Cubs. Uh, yeah, I go for Dean, and then uh, I just wanted to build on, on the last question and focus on an issue that both Bill and Jordan talked about and how do we accelerate, which is this life cycle procurement process. And it seems as if everyone in the panel has agreed that that would lead to a pretty radical shift that could be pretty profitable uh, in, for the construction industry. How do we accelerate that? How do we get there faster? Uh, can I can I uh, express? I'm going to dissent. Um, I've heard about life cycle costing now for the 40 years. I think have been engaged in the building industry one way or another, and it's absolutely right. It's the right way to plan. And I just have a feeling. That, think about this. At least for the federal government, we don't want a capital budget. The 46 billion dollars that my buildings are worth and the three. Don't appear on an asset sheet anywhere. The fact that they are wasting or depreciating is nowhere accounted for. Which means that when we go to the Hill and say, as I do, I got $46 million worth of assets, I ought to be investing 2 or 4% every year in major rehab, and they say, yeah, well, that's but you're competing with building a fence on the border or putting money in front of them. I think if it's going to happen, it's not going to be because we're depending on the kindness of strangers to think about the future because Americans, I'm sorry to say right now, aren't terribly good at that. Um, you know, our savings rate is down, was up briefly, in the recession is now down again. Uh, I think we need to figure, maybe it's a different way we price the upfront, maybe there's a way we can figure out that the upfront cost has to be uh, has to include some guarantee, a revolving fund, a sinking fund, or something that will maintain the assets. The only way I can think that this that this might be able to be accomplished. Yeah. And this is only a, a very partial answer, but the uh, the most the single most successful thing my office has done, and it began in the uh, Clinton administration, was to privatize all of the family housing on military bases, 200,000 units of family housing. It was under-maintained, chronically under-invested in by the services. It had become a quality of life issue for military families. Uh, when we, <coughs> we, we privatize it, which means we provide the land in exchange for a developer renovating or building new, uh, they don't have a captive audience. They have to compete for, for soldiers and sailors, but those soldiers and sailors have a basic housing allowance, which, which they can spend in town or in these units. I mean, that when we privatize it, boy, that will align the incentives automatically. And they, um, they have an incentive. They have this asset for 50 years. And they, they maintain it beautifully. They built it well, new. Uh, I mean, that, 
I would like to see us do a lot more on our installations of that kind of thing. But, but just to be clear here, I'm actually talking about a slightly different idea. I, mean, I agree about that. The, the accounting problems that it causes the government to undercapitalize the income of assets is a huge issue. But I'm just talking about the process by which we deliver these buildings, yeah. where we say, okay, <clears throat> instead of let's buy the design for as cheaply as possible, with, you know, with the exceptions of the work that you guys have been doing with design excellence, then let's low bid the thing to the lowest contract, the lowest bidder, and then let's give the asset and let the government figure out how to run it. If the performance characteristics were determined up front and the compensation strategy was part of how the building actually performs, you force the teams to look at the problem holistically. But that is a radical departure from government procurement philosophy. And it's, uh, it's much of the alternative project delivery movement, which has been catalyzed by this idea that we can digitally simulate a building so we can predict its behavior, therefore we're willing to take responsibility for it, is coming out of these kinds of ideas. But their business problems are not ultimately technology issues. How much does forcing the, the builders, the engineers, designers, et cetera, to uh, eat cost overruns that are their fault? How much of that would drive innovation? And you sort of alluded to that a little bit, that there's no incentive, uh, exact incentives are do overruns because you make more money. Right? Yeah. Well, you, you, you could, but we, we already do that. It, it does, does, it does mean there's a lot of litigation. Yeah. It just I mean, the question of who's small. I mean, I'd say that um, to Phil's point, that the, one of the one of the things that might change here is that uh, one of the things that would be interesting to see would be how people would assess the risk profile exactly. if they were required to say um, either the design build firm would have to put money in escrow. I don't know how they would do that, or put up a guarantee or something. Um, that that if things don't work out the way they projected, that you know that. They're somewhat on the hook. No, I mean, you know, the way it's being done on the private side, and some jobs that I worked on, and one that I was a client on, is we set the, compensa the profit compensation aside as the buffer. So if the objectives were not met, the first thing we did to solve the problem of the objective not being met was spending off the profit that was allocated to the team. There are structural ways to do this, but it requires people to bend their heads around ideas that they've never thought about before in a very low margin and low risk business environment. Okay, I want to go over I saw them, so I guess we're in right here. Um, Mr. Peck, on the uh, sewer infrastructure and things like that, there now is a system of asset management for lo localities for the uh, sewer and public works wastewater treatment, water treatment systems. And um, it has those asset, those um, infrastructure pieces being entered on the books of the, of the locality as assets with maintenance schedules and things like that. And it's a relatively uh, new system, last few years, and um, it has some possibility, except it's coming in with the headwind of the local economies. Being strapped anyway. As I said, I, there's there's no problem sort of figuring out what you ought to be setting aside for investing each year or each ten years, whatever the cycle is, to maintain your asset. It's a question of actually doing it when you're supposed to get the budget when you're supposed to. And I mean, there really is no way to guarantee it, but we, at least we ought to cost it up. Probably ought to cost it up front. And I guess we could, Congress or the Office of Energy and Budget could require us uh, not just to tell us what it's going to cost to operate, to build a building, but could say, give us a net present value of operating this building for 30 years. That would be a different, uh, different way of budgeting as well. So we have, uh, we have time to really just for one more, we'll try to squeeze you two more. So uh, here, uh, and then the next Thank you. Uh, my name is Jay Helman. I often introduce myself as an over-educated real estate developer. <laughs> and my over-education is in math and computer science. In 1980, I started thinking about the relationship between the evolution of these technologies and real estate. I was building downtown office buildings, and I said, if you step back and you look at it in a more abstract vision, you see an office building and a computer as the same thing. What do you do in office buildings? You process and communicate information. So in a sense, in 1980, 
it was like we were the electrons and we were the CPUs and storage was file rooms and libraries and buildings were the information processing factories and the transportation network was communication. You were moving people to information or information to people. So I, I want to just applaud the conversation today and suggest an even larger context to understand that buildings aren't islands. They're pieces of a network, and in fact, we live on spaceship Earth, because most people measure the relationships between points in space in units of time. If you ask somebody how far is it from where you live to where you work, they usually answer minutes, not miles, which is a function of technology. I want to just make one other comment, Rob. Your comment about scale, there's more computing power, as you know so well, in this little box than used to fill buildings when I was in college. And those buildings had to have underfloor air conditioning to keep the computers cool. So I'm going to caution against thinking that scale is the solution because <coughs> we actually are all becoming one by virtue of broadband communication linking us. So I'd like to introduce flexibility and thinking. Thank you. Can I make a very quick comment sure. on that? I think the, what you hit on is really important. You're talking about interacting network and engineered systems, which are buildings, which in general are called cyber physical systems. So whether you talk about smart buildings or smart transportation or smart uh, infrastructure or smart grid and so forth, smart healthcare, there's lots of opportunity. And what we have to talk about are the interoperability issues, the uh, cybersecurity issues, the standards issues, and, and so forth that are cross-cutting these domains. There's tremendous opportunity. Which is why this is so important to help make sure that communication takes place. So maybe we need a more law for construction, which is that performance improved doubles every 19 years. <laughs> 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 so Jim, we've got the last comments. Yeah. Much, much related. Uh, first, I want to say that you identify yourself. Uh, well. Jim Turner, uh, Association of Public Land Universities. And uh, uh, Ellen Rogers next to me, and I uh, wrote a letter on the, uh, not a letter, but an article in the uh, Issues of Science and Technology relates to this topic, but in a different part of the industry in the, uh, uh, in the, residential, in the residential sector. And I would follow up on what the such gentleman said. Uh, you know, we, we, we use words like building maintenance and, and infrastructure and so on. What, we're, what I think IT does is it gives us the ability to go beyond towards the ideal of what these, uh, uh, what the buildings, what the, the homes, and what the infrastructure should we're not really where we should be in any of these areas. And uh, it's a way to, I think it's a way to integrate in the, the research that Sean is working on. And uh, it is a way, it's a way to think big picture. So I want to congratulate you on this. And I hope that we continue this discussion because uh, we just really uh, touched the surface on it. Right, thank you. And I think there are copies of Jim and Ellen's article out there if you want to take a look at it. So, uh, so um, we are one minute over. I apologize. Uh, but I think it's really great.